Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Mead Garden is one of my favorite places to go to look at nature, especially birds. So I'm going to share why. And thank you for joining us today. Um, this opening slide, that photo was taken kind of near the restrooms about a week and a half ago. Um, I, now, I've given credit. There's several wonderful photographers that come to the park. Sylvia is one of them, and um, she captured this, and it actually went national, and I'll show you what I mean in a few minutes. So we're going to talk, I'm going to talk to you about bird migration and why meat is a migration hotspot, some of the year-round birds you find here, winter residents, spring and summer residents, where to go look for birds, and things you can do to help birds. So some birds migrate to find food. So songbirds will pass through central Florida en route to the Appalachians, northeast U.S. and Canada. They've been wintering in the Caribbean and Central and South America. Here's a black and white warbler right here. So if you look at this map, this is a black pole warbler in the picture. This is one of the warblers that sometimes stop here at Mead, and it's the furthest migrating songbird. Other, there's other birds that go further, but it's tiny. It's only about this big. And um, it will go all the way from South America to Alaska. And sometimes we get lucky and we see them. And it's just so amazing when you see a bird like this and you know what it's gone through. So we're thankful that Mead is here because Mead, because of the variety of trees, the water here, um, there's plenty of food for these birds, there's insects, there's berries, and there's places to rest, and that's super important. Um, Mead Garden is known to people that bird as a bird hotspot for migration. Um, Mead is 48 acres owned by the city of Winter Park and managed by Mead Botanical Garden Incorporated. So why do people come to Mead? There is plenty of places for food, shelter, and water. You know, we're in an urban landscape and it, you, you'll probably see people walking around right now. Today's kind of a slow day, so other days you'll see just a whole lot of people and they've got their cameras and their binoculars. There's a variety of habitats here. There's open water, there's a pond, there's wetlands down on the boardwalk. Um, there's uplands up here in the picnic area. 195 bird species have been documented on eBird. eBird is a, is a website. It is one of the longest running um, citizen science projects in the world. And um, people that bird watch often will note the birds on that, which is important so that people, the scientists, the researchers know what's where. So that's a lot of birds to be in this park. There's 23 species of warblers. Warblers are the small little birds that are really hard to see often. They're often high up in the trees, but they're beautiful and they're colorful. And we get 23 different ones. Um, this is a black throated blue. And I saw one of these here last week. So someone saw one this morning. So it's, it's just, they're little jewels. There are some resident birds here. There's wood ducks that you can see at the pond and red-shouldered hawks and some owls that some of you know about and lots of woodpeckers. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the different birds. So here's our barred owls. Um, raise your hand if you've seen a barred owl here before. Yeah, they're pretty famous. Um, sometimes that, that one, a couple weeks ago just landed on the boardwalk. You just never know where they're going to show up. I've seen them all over. There's no one particular place and they're so, so beautiful. So Mead Owls were selected for the cover photo of eBird a couple weeks ago, which we were so shocked. It's like, this is international. Um, so Mead has made, <laughs> made the big news there. And this is run through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And this is one way that out-of-town birders know to come to me. They're like, oh, wow, look at that. And they come here on purpose. So we also have a variety of hawks here. Um, there have been red-shouldered hawks that nest here. So it's really wonderful that they're the tall trees that are here that they would want to nest in. Um, and that's a young one on the left there. And sometimes you'll hear them 
you know, calling through the, the woods and you'll see them carrying, you know, snakes and things like that. There's Cooper's hawks, which are the adult are very gray on the back. Um, and I've seen these around. These are a little quieter. They don't, they don't make a lot of noise because they, they hunt birds. You think about it, the red shoulder hunts reptiles mostly, so reptiles really don't hear them. They make a lot of noise, but these guys are quiet. And down at the bottom, that, that's a bar chart showing when these birds are here, so pretty much all year. These are wonderful, red-bellied woodpeckers. Isn't that a great picture on the, uh, the little bush that was out in the, um, near the butterfly garden? This was taken a few weeks ago. And this little woodpecker is kind of funny because he has something going on with his feathers, and I've seen that particular bird before. They're very, and if you have um, a yard garden, you probably have these in your yard. And we have the wonderful pileated woodpecker. So those of you who remember Woody Woodpecker? This is Woody Woodpecker. They're the largest woodpecker in North America currently. The ivory build was a little bigger, but we don't believe there are any more of those. And they'll make these big cavities. So we think it's wonderful that Mead, you know, some of the pines were dead and needed to come down. And so um, we, we requested that they weren't taken all the way down, that they were topped. And guess what? The pileated woodpeckers used those this year. So it's good that that habitat was there. And a lot of people have got to enjoy watching them um, feed the babies. And I've heard that the babies fledged not, not but a few days ago. So they're flying around. We have the most beautiful wood ducks. This is a native duck of Florida. This is the male, has so many colors. He's so pretty. They're kind of shy, but occasionally at Alice's Pond, They'll be floating around. Um, there are wood, book, wood duck nest boxes right there on the edge. Sometimes they use those. Sometimes they use tree cavities. The babies, when they hatch, they jump out of the tree or the nest box. It's crazy. And they don't hurt. They don't get hurt when they fall. Um, and they all jump out of the tree or the nest box, and then the parents gather them up and take them to the water. So those, those are here. We have other residents, um, starting from the left is a brown thresher. Someone saw one this morning here, uh, state bird of Georgia. A lot of Carolina wrens, and right now the wrens have had babies and they're so chattery and they're just jumping around. So if you walk out in the gardens today, you'll probably see those. And hangas like the lake, the, the blackbird, uh, the male with the silver edge. Um, limpkins, the bottom left, they, they make a screaming sound. If you don't know what one is, it might, might alarm you a little bit, but then you'll see the bird, and they love the snails. Um, good time of year right now for the marsh rabbits, and there may be some cottontails here too in the uplands. So a lot of rabbits out right now, and then that's a little downy woodpecker on the right. And so these are here pretty much year round. Um, Spring and summer, we have this beautiful northern perula, which is a warbler that nests here, and they actually like the Spanish moss. Spanish moss does not hurt trees, despite what you may have heard, um, and it's an important place where insects live that birds can eat, and these birds actually put their nest right in there. And if you go out and stand, you'll hear a bird that's kind of going like a weep, weep, this is this guy. This is a great crested flycatcher, keeping our insect population down. And they'll like to sit on the top of the trees and they will sally out and get a bug and come back. And they're very noisy. And they're nesting somewhere here. They probably have a tree cavity that they're nesting in. So they'll be here through the summer. And then we have this guy. This is a yellow-billed cuckoo. It's a real bird. They saw five of these a couple of days ago. I saw one yesterday. They're really hard to find. They're very shy. They like to hide up high in the tree, but if you get lucky, one will fly right in front of you. And they make a crazy laughing call. Um, and they'll eat things like you know insects and lizards and stuff like that. So really cool. You're very lucky if you get to see a cuckoo here. We have a lot of these. This is the gray catbird. And there's still some here. They're starting to sing. They're going to go north really soon, within a few weeks. 
So they're related to mockingbirds. They can mimic. Behind it is a, is a Tennessee warbler. I'll talk about that one in a few minutes. This is the beautiful yellow-throated warbler. Fall, winter, and spring. They'll be high up in the tree. They're usually very hard to see, but every now and then you'll get lucky and you'll see this beautiful bird that's got the gray and the black and the yellow and the white. And we, oh my gosh, what is that? That's the yellow-throated warbler. This is prairie warbler. I saw a couple of these today. So you might see a bright yellow bird flitting around in the trees. Um, Mid-level to up high, and it has black stripes streaking down the sides. This is called a prairie warbler. They don't live in the prairie. Birds don't always have the most, most accurately descriptive names. So that's okay. They are very beautiful, and, and they are here in the fall, winter, and spring just not the summer. Some birds, they know better and they go north. <laughs> we still have some of these here right now. Um, you may have them where you live. These are the gorgeous cedar wax wings. Um, they look kind of a cardinal size, but they have a lot of yellow on their front. And they have this mask, I call them the Batman bird because they kind of look like Batman. And they have a yellow tip on their tail. And they love berries. So there's a couple mulberry trees here which the birds and the squirrels absolutely love. And they will gobble those whole berries just right down. It's fun to watch. There's still a few here, so you'll see them fly in a very tight formation, and they have a very high-pitched whistle. So beautiful cedar wax wings. We have some birds that blend in really well, and they tend to be on the ground or in the interior of trees. These are called thrushes. This is the hermit thrush. There was there was some that stayed over the winter and they would hang out kind of by the, um, the concrete bridge and on the other side. And they like to flip the leaves and look for insects in the leaves. And they're, they're very well camouflaged. And these beauties. We do get painted buntings here. The male is on the left and the female's on the right. The male is the one that's responsible for me getting into birds. Because <laughs> the first one I ever saw was at um, Cumberland Island, Georgia. We were just hiking. And I saw that bird and went, whoa, I want to know more. And then it just kind of went from there. But they like the, they like the bushes. Um, they like low shrubs. And so they find a lot of places to find food here. And they're kind of hard to see because, believe it or not, that rainbow color bird can blend in <laughs> really well. It's amazing to see that, so we're happy that they're here. We find unexpected things here. So th this is Bob White, Northern Bob White, which is a type of quail. And we discovered some here about a month ago. And we're seeing them on and off, which is you don't expect to find a, a quail in the middle of a city. But they're here and they're finding what they need, so that's a wonderful thing that that they find a safe haven here, because this is a species that's in decline. So uh, you get lucky if you see one. One day I was just walking in the afternoon and one walked on the bike path. I thought, what is that? <laughs> and yeah, you might hear it called the Bob White call. So you never know. And then we have the rarer birds that just pass through. So we're in spring migration right now. And when birds are going north, they're kind of in a hurry because they want to get to the breeding grounds and get the best nest spot. So they don't stay here very long. They might be here for a day, if we're lucky. Um, if the winds are good, they don't even stop. In the fall, they might stay for two weeks because they're just kind of making their way back south. They're not in a hurry. They're just getting as much food as they can. So this picture was taken in the fall here. This is a Tennessee warbler. And this is beautyberry, which is a wonderful native plant. And it has flowers that the butterflies come to, and the birds enjoy the berries in the fall and the winter. So this was a um, Tennessee warbler, and no, they're not from Tennessee. <laughs> I guess you can occasionally find them there, and it was just feasting on the berries. And then we have these sometimes. This is the little golden jewel of the forest. This is the prothonotary warbler, bright yellow, gray wings. We had several in the fall that kind of hung out by the creek, and they do like water. We have some that nest in central Florida, but usually a little more north of here. They, they'll nest by rivers, like the Wakaiba River, 
and they are just be and their song is beautiful. So you're very lucky if you get to see one of these. And another bird that comes through here is the bay-breasted. And last fall, there was about 25 of these that decided to come to me. I think it was late September, and just created quite a stir with the people that look for birds. And they, they found what they needed. This is just a wonderful resting place for them. And they stayed for about a week before they left. And this guy, this beautiful bird, I took this picture here, like last week. This is called a Cape May warbler. Um, no, they don't live in Cape May. They've been seen in Cape May. Actually, the first one that was named was seen in Cape May. That was a long time ago. And after that bird was named there, another one did not show up for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> but they come mostly through the central U.S. and they breed like up in the northern part of the United States and Canada, Alaska. But just gems, you see that brilliant yellow, they have orange on their face, they have a black head. This is a male. The females are a little more subtle, but they're still beautiful. So there's still some here now. Just, it takes a lot of patience to see these guys. And the hooded warbler. So this hooded warbler, particular one, last year, stayed for about two weeks, and it would hang out. You, there's some benches right behind this building by the creek. And this bird put on a show about every day and would just hop around the branches. We all loved it. We just watched it. And it was just beautiful. Hooded warbler. They have that hood on their head. This bird, I, I, it, all these pictures were taken here, by the way. So this is a summer tanager. And this is a male. The females are yellow. The males are red. A young male will have both colors because young birds start with the female color and then they change over. So this guy was hanging around here in the late winter. It was an early arrival. It got here early. So it hung out mean. It was enjoying that mulberry tree. And it's gone now. It may even be up at Wakaiba Springs because that's where some of them breed. So he found a great, great place to hang out until it's time to go a little bit more north. This was quite the star. This was 2021. I remember getting a text. I was somewhere else. And someone said, there's a cerulean warbler at Mead. I was like, whoa. So a lot of people came over here. The bird stayed for one day. It stayed all day. It was back here on the creek. And this is a very, very rare bird. Um, they usually are high up in the mountains. Um, occasionally one comes through. So we were really excited to see that cerulean warbler. Very pretty blue bird. And yeah, it was great. And then we had really rare birds. So um, as part of my position at Audubon, we, we do stuff with young birders, ages about eight to 17. And um, we, were, we were out here in this young birder named Ethan and his dad. They happened to be at me looking for warblers. And his dad sent me a text and said, there's an olive-sided flycatcher right now. I was like, what? And we all come you know, running over, and that was right in one of the trees, one of the dead trees, right by the parking lot. And it stayed here for a few days, and a lot of people got to see it. This is a bird that belongs out west. And sometimes winds will blow birds to the wrong place, you know, storms. But they have a sanctuary here until they rest up, they get fueled up, and off they go. So that was a really exciting bird. All right, now I'm going to switch over. If you want to come looking for birds at Mead, where do you go? So this is a map showing you um, different places. So we're at the reception hall that's been renamed. Um, you can see the pond, and you can. We're, we'll talk about the different things up here. So first of all is the mulberry tree. The mulberry tree is a little bit past the bathroom. It's, it's the largest mulberry tree here. And it's a red mulberry. And um, a lot of birds will love the berries, which are usually in the spring. I think it fruits a little bit in the fall. Um, and this is the cuckoo up in the mulberry tree. And a Baltimore Orioles will come here. Yesterday there was orchard Orioles here. They were feeding on the the one with the yellow flowers. It starts with a T. Tabo, you guys know. Tabo Booyah. There you go. 
Um, that's also a popular plant here, even though that's not native. The birds do like the nectar, some of them. So the Orioles do eat nectar and the leaf berries. So the mulberry tree is always a good place to look because a lot of birds like that tree. There is a native plant garden right behind the bathroom on the way to the mulberry tree. And that's another good place. Um, insects are attracted to the native plants, which is a good thing. The native insects, so the birds do that food chain thing and they have plenty of food right there. And then there's what we call the pit. So there, there's a, a low area, it's next to the mulberry. There are trails that go down there. And sometimes there are ducks in that pond. Sometimes you'll see the, the egrets and the herons feeding in there. The flycatchers will like to hang out on the bare branches and look for insects, the, the red-shouldered hawks. In the bushes you'll find birds like catbirds and thrashers and things like that into the pit. You, could, you don't have to go down the pit, you can just look on the edge. And this is looking at the mulberry and then towards uh, where the little stage is. So that's a nice open area and a lot of birds would like to perch out there. And that, that bird on the left um, was the Philadelphia vireo that was here a couple years ago. That was another rare bird and that bird stayed for a while. And when that happens, you get a lot of visitors coming in here looking for this. So there's the butterfly garden and the bird feeders. Always a lot of action. It's a good place when they're here. The painted buntings are pretty much left, I believe. And they don't go far. They'll go to Georgia, South Carolina. They don't go too far, so they come back pretty early here. You'll see these little black and white warblers. I saw some today. Hummingbirds. If you just sit on one of those benches and wait, you'll probably see a hummingbird. It's a good thing just to relax. You'll see them zip around the flowers and, and feed, and they'll sit on little branches. And then there's the boardwalk. The boardwalk is a nice place to just take a little walk, and um, you'll see all kinds of things. You'll see a lot of dragonflies, some butterflies. There's this little metallic bee that's been hanging there. It doesn't ding us, it just looks like just hang in front of you. Um, oven bird. It's named, it's that little one that's down on the bottom with the ring around its eye and the little spots. That's named because its nest looks like an oven. <laughs> I always wonder, Swainson's thrush, so we get thrushes, which are birds that like to be, t tend to be low on the ground. Carolina, a lot of Carolina wrens on the boardwalk and cuckoos. All right, in the winter, and these birds have just left, like within the last two weeks, there are sap suckers, which are type of woodpecker. And when they drill holes, they make these nice, even rows, somewhat even. You can see the holes. You can walk around and see these trees now. The birds are gone, but they leave those holes. And they're really important because what they're doing is they're making a little um, hole into the inner layer of the tree and the sap runs out. They come back later to drink the sap. And occasionally they'll get an insect that gets stuck in there. And other animals will also drink the sap. So they're considered um, and a very important keystone species because it provides habitat and food for other, other things. Hummingbirds will even come to, to drink the nectar there. And they're, they're very handsomely marked. They, they look different than your normal woodpecker that you'd see around. So there are some trees around. I know there's one back here. There's one by the barred owl tree. And just, you know, if you see the little holes, and you won't see them in pines, you'll see them in hardwood trees. So then there's the picnic area, which is right out from the parking lot. And birds often will go in the oak. Oaks are very important for birds. Oaks support a lot of insects that the birds need. And that's the American red start. The black, I call it the Halloween bird because it's black and orange. Um, great place and a good place to pick. You can picnic and see the birds coming around. And of course, we have a star right now. We have some swallowtail kites here. They like to nest here for the past couple of years, which is wonderful. This is a bird that's being watched. It's, it's on the watch list um, because of habitat loss. They're finding less places to nest. They need tall trees. 
So you probably see, if you're around this area, you're going to see them flying low over the road some point in time because they're here. Because there's a lot of tall trees here. They have to take off from a high point. They don't fly up from the ground just the way their wings are. So, um, yeah, and it's carrying something. So if you, if you come to the, like the amphitheater and just sit, you'll eventually see one circling around. And they're out there, they're, they're getting ready to nest or they're nesting, and when the babies hatch, they'll be actively catching things up in the top of the trees and bringing like, things like lizards and snakes and stuff like that. Um, you'll also see Cooper's hawks. Um, that's a wood stork. Okay, battery's running low. All right. Let me see if I can just do that. Okay. Um, over in the picnic area, there's gopher tortoises. And you'll see some areas marked off. And they're, they're doing quite well here. So that's another um, important species that's here. So there's the picnic and native planted, planting area that's been um, maintained by the... Um, Native Plant Society here, they do a great job. They just did a whole lot of plantings last fall, and they're looking really good. And this is a place, so there you see the Baltimore Oriole and the Northern Perula, and they'll just be up and around the treetops. We've had red-tailed hawks nest here. So the red tail is bigger than the red shoulder. It's less common in Florida. They like to eat small mammals, rats and mice and things like that. And so there's a little bit less food for them. Lots of reptiles here in Florida. And they're a bigger bird and they have a, a band, a speckled band on their belly. And they're very handsome. So sometimes you're out in the picnic area, you'll see them fly over. Also, you could possibly see these another gems called indigo buntings. Indigo buntings are moving through our area right now on migration. And they are, the males are bright blue. So if you're very lucky, you get to see an indigo bunting. And the picnic area, you can also find those other warblers like the Cape May. It's just another view of the Cape May warbler. And the summer tanagers. So if you see a red bird, don't assume it's a cardinal. If it doesn't have a crest and it has a, like a grayer bill and not a, it bill is a lot uh, heavier, you're seeing a tanager. And around the greenhouses, this is a scarlet tanager here, and these are moving through our area right now. So they're bright red with black wings. They're just striking. And they do like that kind of dense woods down in the clay pit and around the greenhouse. And there's the cuckoo again. <laughs> We're always looking for cuckoos. And the cuckoos nest here. So you could still see them throughout you know, early summer. And you might recognize some of those trees there. Oops, I went too fast. Alice's Pond, a great place to see the wood ducks, sometimes mallards. I saw mallards there this morning. Um, there's a little uh, bridge over there. That's a good place to stand and look around. Cooper's Hawk likes that too. And then the garden house area, which is where we're at, the trees on either side here, it's good for the small warblers. Um, that's a female Cape May on the left. On the right is a Blackburnian. We're still looking for one of those this year. So the Blackburnian has a bright orange face and black streaks, and they're just amazing. And the hooded warblers have been here too. So watching birds is like a never-ending scavenger hunt. You're always looking. You're always looking, always. You just never stop. But it's good. It's good for you. Well, it's, it keeps your brain active, you know, you're always, you know, just kind of, as long as it doesn't interfere with your driving yourself, it's fine. <laughs> um, here's the Native Plant Garden, a project of the um, Tar Flower Chapter of the Native Plant Society. So if you have time, you know, walk up and you, you have several locations, but the newest planting is straight out in the pines, and they have everything labeled, so you can enjoy that, and yeah, they're, they're doing really well. Here's a, so there's another place um, I'll show you on the map on the next slide called Warbler's Corner. And if you're not a birder, you wouldn't know what Warbler's Corner is. So it's a little corner. It's kind of outside the gate, but still part of the property. And sometimes the warbler's like that. Not always. 
And this isn't this a handsome bird? This is a magnolia warbler. It's a beautiful yellow, black, got a ring around its eye. And that's where Warbler Corner is. So we check that out sometimes. Then there's the island. The island, um, there's two bridges. This side has a wooden bridge. The other side has a concrete bridge. And now there's a nice gravel path through there. Um, often floods when there's storms. Now you might wonder what that weird looking bird is on the left. It's just very strange. And that's a, a Chuck Wills widow. One of those birds, I don't know, some people have them by their home and they'll call all night long. Chuck Wills widow, Chuck Wills widow. Hardly ever you get to see them in the day because they're so camouflaged. They'll lay on a branch and look like the branch. So someone that was a really good birder found that bird, wasn't me. This is another place to find the beautiful prothonotaries, to find um, thrushes. And that shows the two bridges, the wooden bridge um, and then the concrete bridge on either side. And there's a nice black and white warbler eating some kind of insect. And the black and white warblers look like little zebras, right? And they like to climb up and down the bark. So if you see a bird climbing up and down the bark, that's probably what it is. All right, so we have this wonderful creek that runs behind, and it rises and falls with our rainfall. Um, last year, after all those storms, it was a raging torrent. It was pretty incredible. But now it's kind of dropped way down. And that right there, I believe, is the Whippoorwill. It's hard to tell the two apart. They look very similar. And we have some different warblers. And the one in the top right with the black throat is called a black-throated green. Really, really handsome. And they were here last fall. The one on the bottom right is called a water thrush. And you'll see the little bird hopping and he's constantly moving his tail. He's bobbing. It's like he's dancing. Those like the creek. So join the 45 million Americans who bird. It is easy. And those who take photos. There's a lot of enjoyment. Yep, that's it. when you know, you'll see people looking up. You say, oh, what are you looking at? And most uh, birders are very friendly. And um, just you can walk up and say, oh, what are you looking at? They'll be glad to tell you. All right, so we're going to switch gears and talk about if you have a yard, what do you, can you do to attract more birds? And so the big thing is you want native plants because the insects, which is mostly the food for birds, they are adapted to eat the plants of our area. There are beautiful plants you can get, you know, from the nursery, you know, all kinds of exotic things. And they're beautiful and it's okay to have some, but if that's all you have, you have no food for the birds because the insects will not go to those. You'll notice the leaves will never get eaten. That's not a good sign. That means nothing's using it as food. You want your leaves chewed up a little bit and they'll come back. Um, that's food for the birds, especially the ones that come through in migration. They're depending on that and the birds that are raising babies. So migration season is ending soon and will be on breeding season. And the birds need that, those insects to feed their babies, those caterpillars. So it's really important to plant natives. Um, even if you put, you know, one section of your yard for natives, that'll be, you know, something to help the, the birds and the other animals. So if you want to know more about native plants, you want to go to the website for the Native Plant Society. And, and this presentation will be archived on Mead's website, so you can go back and you can look and say, oh, what do I need to look for? Because it will give you all the information. And they have wonderful plant sales, including here in other locations, and that's where you want to get your plants. And they can also guide you to native plant nurseries that are around. Because sometimes at those big box stores, it'll say that it's a native plant, maybe not. Or it may be sprayed with something that's not good. So you really want to go to a native plant nursery. There's another great website, you won't have any trouble remembering, National Audubon they have a tab on their website called Plants for Birds, and it is amazing. 
that you'll be able to find information to help you in getting the right things. Because a lot of us just don't know. I know. I had no idea years ago when I planted milkweed that it wasn't the right kind, right? If you plant the wrong kind, it's bad for the butterflies. So you want to make sure you get the native. So what you do on this website, if you put your zip code in, it's going to generate a list of plants for your area, a whole lot. And it'll tell you which birds like that plant, which butter, if you, if you, and most of us, if we enjoy birds, we enjoy everything. We enjoy butterflies, dragonflies. So it'll tell you the butterflies that it, it'll be a source of food for as well. And you can just go through and say, oh, okay, I like that one, I like that one. And then, okay, where do you find it? So it'll also have a list nurseries. And it does have a thing, I haven't tried this, but it has a way you can order online. But I'm, I don't know how that works because I haven't done that yet. But it looks really useful in places where you can also get seeds online. So very, very helpful. So just to reiterate one more thing about the native plants, I'm just going to go back to this slide. Having leaves chewed is a good sign. It means something is using it, okay? So I always feel good when I see that on my plants and know that when that season is over, the, the plant's going to regrow those leaves and it'll be fine. Okay, so we're going to go to a few other things you can do. So we're in migration time, and most of the little birds, they migrate at night. It's safer for them because the raptors are not out and they migrate by starlight for the most part. So when we have all of our lights on, especially if you have outdoor lights that are directed up, it confuses the birds. Um, if you're in a high rise building, you know, the lights going out. So there's things you can do. Um, turn off non-essential lighting um, from 11 to six, April and May, September, October, um, just like at the beach, if you're in a, you know, a condo or high rise, you want to have your curtains pulled at night so your lights don't shine out and confuse the birds. And those are just simple things we can do that can help. You can talk to your community if you have street lights, making sure that they're facing downward and not, and if they're going up, they're wasted light anyway, so you want them directed downwards. That's one simple thing. If you have invasive plants, you want to remove what you can because there's a lot of Florida. Everything loves Florida. We have such a wonderful climate. So there, there are some things that might look kind of pretty, but they take over and they take away from the natives. So if you can, um, remove the invasives. Learn what they are. And that's what the Native Plant Society can definitely help you with that. Another thing, and I, I'm a dog owner and I love all animals. But um, out, cats outside are a big, big problem. Um, when birds are migrating, they're tired and they're often on the ground and they're easy prey. Um, even if your cat's well fed, it'll, it hunts. That's what they do. The same thing with dogs. I always walk my dog on a leash because I know if there was a bird hopping on the ground and it was tired, my dog would go for it. Even though I love my dog and she knows better. But, so keep your pets contained. Snags. Snags are so important. Snags are a dead tree that's standing. Now, sometimes we must take them down because they're threatening a building or a structure. Totally understandable. But if there's a place that you have one, even if you top it, like you can see that photo, that's taken from the garden, and that's where the woodpeckers nested this year. They had a place. So if you can just top it, you know, and explain to your neighbor, say, this, a snag can hold over 300 species of different kinds of animals. So even like flying squirrels will live in there, all kinds of stuff. And so they're really important, you know, bluebirds, woodpeckers, um, all kinds of stuff. Flickers, screech owls, they like those. So that's another thing you can do. And in part of your yard, leave leaves. There's a couple of things that really need those, that leaf cover. Um, here's an oven bird. A lot of birds will flip the leaves and eat the insects. Bees, which we desperately need, that are pollinators. Most of our bees don't live in hives. They're solitary and they burrow underground and they need the leaves. So leave areas of leaves. You know, you can have your manicured part, but have a part that this is, this is for, for our, um, our pollinators, for the birds, super important. All right, there is a new sign over here 
by The Office, which we love. And this was taken, a, I think, last week, showing some of the birds that were seen. Oh, yeah, another, and I expect there was a turkey here, at least for a week. I never saw it. My friends saw it. And I was like, I want to find that turkey. And it was hanging around the pit. So you can just see all the different things that were seen. Some people put draw pictures up there. Well, I see they had a black and white warbler, and they had the mallard. And what do you mean by the office? Where is this? Uh, let's see. Back over there. Where the mural is, uh -huh. it's on the other side, up on the steps. So you can add your sightings if you're here. So we lead bird walks every Saturday in April and October. And you, it's, it's good. We prefer you to sign up ahead of time. That way we know how many people are coming. And Larry Martin is in charge of that. So it's lmartin5 at msn.com. You just email him and say, hey, I want to come out. Uh, we meet close to the, as close as you can park to this building. Just park there and you'll see Larry and, and, and always a few people that are helping Larry, like Terry Breeze will be there this week. And they have loaner binoculars if you need binoculars and they'll lead you on a walk and you get to see all these spots I just showed you. And you'll have some people that are more experienced that point out some birds that maybe you'd miss and see other stuff. Um, too. We often find other kinds of animals when we're out and about. And that's every Saturday in April and October because that's the high migration time. So there is one this Saturday, Earth Day, and there is one on the 29th. So we hope you can come out and join us for that. And we're going to take some questions. 8 8 yes, yes, that would be 8 a.m. You can get here like a 7.45 to 7.55, and you'll be all set and ready to go. And here's my contact information. And I actually, after questions, I have Audubon flyers. And I brought also a few bird checklists. And I also brought a plans for birds um, little brochure if you're interested in learning more about that. So I know there's a procedure for questions here. Yes? No? no? Go ahead. OK. All right. Question? Challenge. Okay. And I want to know: Is there a coyote or a fox on need? And also, what makes certain birds come to certain trees during? Because I've seen swallowtail kites for the last three seasons at Maitland Community Park, and they come to the exact same. Okay. All right. So Merlin, I'll start with Merlin. Mm -hmm. Merlin is an app for your phone, and Merlin is very helpful. So Merlin um, has several different features. Now I'm going to say this, Merlin is not 100% accurate. And it's, it's just, you know, what's well, good because people are smarter than machines, right? So Merlin can help you. And I use Merlin a lot, especially if I'm tra traveling and I'm in a brand new place and I have no idea what the birds sound like there and stuff. So Merlin has different features. It, it has a questionnaire. Like if you see a bird and you have no idea what it is and you don't get a picture of it, you can start with, um, it, you go through idea bird and it, it asks you five questions like, you know, you pick out what size it was and what colors it was. It'll give you a list of possibilities and you can see if you think it matches or not. It also has um, a photo ID, so if you're able to get a photo, you can try to match it up that way. And the photo ID works pretty good and it has sound. Sound ID is still getting worked out. It works about half the time. Sometimes it'll say something is way wrong. So if, if it seems like it doesn't belong there, it probably is not that bird. But Merlin is helpful. Um, so, OK. I don't know anything about the coyote or fox, but those are in the area. Not so much foxes anymore. I think foxes were more abundant. I've, I've seen very few for a long time. Um, Birds come to certain trees. Some birds will nest at the same tree every year. That's what, probably what's what. What's in their makeup that they fly these great distances and come to the same tree? That's that's a, a good question. <laughs> I don't know exactly the answer to that, but I know that's why it's so important. And I know our area is we're undergoing a lot of growth and a lot of things are cut down. So you got to think about whatever things came to those trees. 
and now they're cut down, they, they have to find a new place, hopefully. So that's a big problem. So where areas can be preserved like this, that's wonderful. Because you see the kites have been coming back here for at least three years now. And the Maitland Community Park, same thing. So that's very important. I know my neighborhood, you see this like every year the red shoulder hawks come. So yeah, they, they're finding what they need there. I forgot what your other question. Oh, okay, so typically the summer is not as great for birding, yes and no. I used to think, oh, okay, in the summer I won't go birding, I'll, I'll catch up on this, that, and <laughs> doesn't happen. So the summer is when we have baby birds, which is kind of cool to see. Summer is very humid and very hot, and if you're gonna go look for birds, you're gonna go in the morning early. And you're gonna quit by 10 or 10.30, because otherwise you'll just be a puddle, right? But we do something called June Challenge. So someone started this up in Gainesville several years ago because they thought, people aren't going out looking for birds. Let's get people outside in the summer instead of watching TV or whatever. Um, so they made a challenge. And you have to see how many birds you can find in the month of June. And you can't use calls. Using calls is not a good idea, especially in the summer, because birds are nesting. And when you play a call, you could pull a bird off its nest because it'd be, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, bird want my territory. I got to go chase it away. Well, the bird can leave its nest and the predator can come. So playing bird calls is not recommended. But um, so we go out, we can't play calls, and you have to see the bird. Because a lot of times when we go out looking for birds, if we hear it, we count it because we know what it is. But in the summer, you have to find it. So it makes you become a more skilled birder. So I know. Everywhere we have a little contest. It's just for bragging rights of who can find the most, and it's by county, so you can do whatever county you want. But it's kind of a fun little thing, and it gets us out. And then by Ju July, actually, the first migrant birds arrive. So migration, actually, for the birds going back south, some birds start as early as July and go as late as November. And spring, some birds start as early as February and go as late as June. So really, most months there's some birds moving somewhere because they got a long way. Some birds go as far as 10,000 miles one way. It's pretty amazing. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Little little tangent. Um, why is it that Every once in a while, you see little birds antagonizing raptors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's called mobbing. It's called mobbing. mobbing. They're mobbing. And the raptor is a threat to their territory or most likely their nest. And they can be very cheeky, these little birds. I've seen little birds. We're talking gnat catchers this, this big. That's one way, so last year I was doing June Challenge and I came to meet because I was looking for the owls. You know, and I was looking around, you know, and the owls are hard to find. When they're sleeping, you know, they don't move. And I saw gnat catchers and they were buzzing around this branch and they were buzzing and making, and sure enough, the owl was there and they were harassing that owl that was sleeping. <laughs> so, and you'll see them, like you'll see the little birds chasing the large ones, like fly across, that's what they're doing. That's a good question. Yeah. Does uh, this, this park, does it have any programs for volunteer or for a camp for high school students? Yeah, and I'll let one of the um, meet people talk about that. And, and for high schoolers at Orange Audubon, we could, we definitely can hook them into volunteer opportunities. 
So I'll, when I pass out these brochures, you'll have my contact information are here. You can email me. There's some things that high schoolers could do. Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I just want to mention, we talked about the Merlin app, but Audubon also has an app, too, that you can use. And there's a, one called BirdNet, which is, I've been trying it recently. It's for bird sounds, for identifying birds' calls. Uh, it's, it's like the Merlin. It's not always correct, but at least it helps. Yeah, it, it definitely gives you like a direction to go in for sure. And sometimes Merlin, I'll have it running just to see if I'm missing anything. And it alert me if something might be around and then I start looking for it. And that's a good point. And yeah, Audubon has a free free yeah. app and it's a nice field guide. And you know, back in the days we'd carry, and some people still carry their field guide with them, which is great, but mine is in my phone. Actually, I have about three on my phone. <laughs> yes? So how do the, all these species make it through the hurricane? Any idea? Yeah, some don't. Um, that's a great point. And, and what happens in hurricanes, too, is a lot of stuff. Is, and you, you think about it, hurricanes are in the fall when birds are migrating. Mm -hmm. So groups of migrating birds will get sucked up in the hurricane and they'll get deposited in places where they shouldn't be. Um, we believe that's how this flamingo ended up at St. Mark's, which is south of Tallahassee. It's still there. The, it's, that's named. It's Pinky. You go up to Tallahassee, go to St. Mark's and go look for Pinky. It's a, flam it's a wild flamingo and it was brought there by a hurricane. I forget which one. Might have been Irma. Um, and it's been there ever since. It's crazy. So some get thrown way off course, some don't make it, but it's, yeah, it's really important after a storm if you're able, if you have feeders, to put feeders out because they might have trouble finding their food source because, you know, a lot of trees got downed and things like that. But storms can bring in a lot of birds and then they kind of make their way back home, but it could take a while. Yes? One second, one more, mm -hmm. probably not uh, totally on target, but. About a month ago, I saw a cardinal, but its face and its crest were white. Oh, you, okay. That cardinal now has a name. Was it at Lou Gardens? No, it was in my front yard. Oh, wow. My bird feeder. Yeah. Wow, okay. I looked and looked and looked for what it was. Yeah, it's there. melanistic, so it's just um, lacking pigment. Okay. So there's one at Lou Gardens right now, okay. and now they've named it Candy. It's a female, and it's beautiful. It's white with kind of the light red. It's beautiful. Um, it's just a pigment thing. It's just a pigment. But it's, just, it's a cardinal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's a cardinal. Mm -hmm. yes. Where does it hang out at Lou? It hangs out at Lou, but I don't know exactly where. Okay. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> uh, mention what you told me about the caterpillars. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. So caterpillars are an important food source for birds to feed their nestlings because it's soft enough for them to digest it. But birds prefer moth caterpillars, okay. not butterfly caterpillars. I didn't know that until this year. Because so I always thought, oh, I'm going to attract all these butterflies, and the birds are going to eat the caterpillar. No, and the moths prefer oaks. So you probably won't even see most of them. But if you have nice, healthy oak trees, they're producing a lot of moths, caterpillars, and they're feeding a lot of birds. Um, there's a... Dr. Doug Tallamy has written several books. He has several, you can go on YouTube and listen to him. He's amazing. He had a property up north, up northeast somewhere. He bought a farm and how he's renaturalizing it and how many species of moths and then birds he's documented through all those, um, through his native plants. It's really, really good. Any questions? Yes. Um, during the migration, do you see sharp chains? Yes, we do. They're pretty, I saw one last week. They probably, we won't see them too much further into, into the spring. sharp shinned hawks look a lot like a cooper's hawk, but they're a lot smaller. They're, gray, they're a gray hawk with a long tail, really fast, and they tend to be in the woods hunting birds. Coopers and sharp shins hunt birds. Yes. Yes. And flying, they're very aggressive. Yes. Really 
really fast. You like will see it and be like zoom, and they don't make any sounds. They're they're silent. They may make sounds on their territory, but here they're, they're quiet. They're hunting birds. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, there's no melt to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if it's not working, yeah, don't put it out. I don't think the, it's just keeping the feeders clean. And hummingbird feeders, yes, it'll go bad. Personally, I just use my native plants because if you have like a fire bush, it grows really well. It's a native, some people call it firecracker bush. And the hummingbirds will come to that. And you don't have to worry about cleaning it out or anything. You know, if you have a hummingbird feeder, you definitely need to clean it every other day in the summer because it'll, it'll spoil. Yeah, you want to be careful. You don't want to make birds sick. Same thing if you have a bird bath. And bird baths are, we didn't even talk about that. But water features, if you have a bird bath, you want to rinse it out every day so you don't have, you know, mosquitoes and stuff growing in the bottom. But birds absolutely love the bird bath, and especially when it gets hot, you know. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Question. Why are red shoulder hawks so <laughs> Right, especially right now. They're nesting. They're nesting right now, but kind of year round. They're just they're they do a you know, one of my friends used to joke, he said they they're announcing that they're there, you know, if if you're <laughs> if you're an animal, get away. <laughs> But I think it's because they hunt mostly reptiles, and I don't. They I, they will take they will take baby birds. They'll take anything they can. Okay. So the other day I was at a park and there was baby ducks and one swooped down. I know it was sad, but cycle of life. <laughs> and they're, yeah, they are very noisy, but they are very territorial around their nest. And I've known people that have had nests by their house. They had to put a uh, bicycle helmet on, go into their car <laughs> until the babies are grown, and all, then the, they stop. But they're going to protect that nest, so you got to be careful. Yes. Yeah, I think they do. Brown? Yeah, they do. Birds will eat those. I guess they're just a little harder to see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the birds. We we see the kites eating lizards. You watch them fly around. You'll see they'll grab a branch and they'll have the kite on. And you'll see them drop the branch, but they'll eat the, the lizard. That's fun. Mm -hmm. What do you know about these Muscovy ducks that are just all over the place? Well, they're non-native and they're messy. and Yeah, they were just a lot of stuff, like I said, loves Florida. So stuff that was brought in, you know, I don't know why people originally brought them in, maybe for the eggs or something, but they do quite well. So... Anything that's brought here that gets loose, easy, does really well. So, therefore, during hurricanes, some things have accidentally gotten loose in South Florida, and they're slowly making their way up here. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. We had Tilliated, when we had a, a house just north of here, um, we had Tilliated woodpeckers for, it was like Nat Geo Wild. <laughs> Yeah, they could be like that. So they're just going to move around the area, but not really migrate. So they found a different neighborhood, but they don't go really far. Yeah, they're just going to move around. <laughs> yeah. And the woodpeckers tap on your roof not to annoy you, but they're, that's, they don't sing, so that's how they attract a mate is the tapping. So if you have a really nice sounding, you know, metal siding or something, they'd be like, oh, that's how they're calling the females. Yeah, they'll do that. Yeah. So, again, it, whenever they say it's good, I'll hand out flyers if you're interested or the native plants or a bird list.
Any other question? Uh, this yes. Is Mm -hmm. has, um, has anybody seen a hawk recently in this in Florida? Not recently. We had one winter time at the Wildlife Drive in Apopka, and it's been coming back pretty much every year for several years. So it's a red-tailed hawk, but it's there's different variations of red-tailed hawk, and so this is one that should be out west, but it, it likes coming here. There's a few birds like that. There's like vermilion flycatchers that are western birds that every year they come here. Not to mead though. Mead's not quite the right habitat for those. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your.